Hello there, Thomas Kissinger, and we have been proofreading through the Noble Berean Four. It's the fourth book in the Noble Berean series, and one of the chapters in this book that is soon to come out is entitled The Ten Theses. I got this idea, of course, from the famous man that lived, Martin Luther, who wrote something called the 95 Theses. And reading a little bit here about Martin Luther, he was born in Germany in 1483. Martin Luther went on to become one of Western history's most significant figures. Luther spent his early years in relative anonymity as a monk and scholar. But in 1517, Luther penned a document attacking the Catholic Church's corrupt practice of selling indulgences to absolve sin. His 95 theses, which propounded two central beliefs, that the Bible is the central religious authority and that humans may reach salvation only uh, by their faith and not by their deeds was to spark the Protestant Reformation. So what's been going on for some time now, an underground movement, so to speak, uh, is God's believers who are receiving revelation from Him concerning what is called an ultimate restoration of all things. And this really speaks of that God will ultimately save all through the Lord Jesus Christ and what He accomplished in His death, burial, and resurrection. Contrary to popular belief that most people, uh, untold billions, will be lost and tortured forever in hell, people are coming to the understanding that Jesus really is who He said He was, the Savior of the world. So in reference to that, I have written what I have referred to as the Ten Theses, and this is meant to spark a reformation. This is meant to awaken people to understand who God really is and what He has accomplished through Jesus Christ. Uh, and it is meant to really start a healthy debate about the subject of what people call eternal hell, and that they would look into it for themselves to see what it's really all about, and if that teaching is really true. So here we go. I just want to read from this short chapter, and it's entitled, The Ten Theses. Disputation on the teaching and belief of eternal torture, commonly known as the Ten Theses. So here we go. Out of a love and concern for the truth of the living God, it is with great joy that I present these ten rock-solid statements in order to refute dismantle dispute and disprove the commonly held false teaching and belief of eternal torture, which has captivated the minds of men and women and blinded us from knowing the one true God, who has saved the human race and reconciled all things to himself through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. These statements represent the voice of those crying in the wilderness who testify to the greatness of God and His unlimited love and power through the saving person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. These points of reformation are to be duly noted in the sense that they have been nailed to the doors of evangelical Christianity demanding a response and that they are meant to ignite a healthy debate and discussion on the topic at hand. They're not meant to be exhaustive and answer every question, but they do bring to the forefront major points of contention and expose doctrinal flaws within the message of modern-day Christianity, the modern-day Christian church. May we humble ourselves to discern the hour of reformation and the time of our visitation, and may God give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him to properly and rightly divide the word of truth, the Holy Scriptures, by the Spirit of the living God. So here we go. Here are my ten points that I bring, uh, that I refer to as the ten theses that I'm nailing to the doors of the message of modern-day evangelical Christianity that claims untold billions and billions will be lost and tortured forever. And here's what we have to say about that against it. Number one, God wins. He cannot and will not be defeated by the powers of darkness and the will of man, 
Paul tells us in Colossians 1.20, there shall be an ultimate reconciliation of all things through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. If this is not the case, then the only two possible conclusions are either God is weak, He wants to reconcile and save all, but He cannot, or number two, God is cruel, He can reconcile and save all, but he doesn't want to. Point number two, God is corrective, not vindictive. The purpose of wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, punishment, and fire is not eternal torture. This is consistent with the character and nature of our Heavenly Father as outlined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Point number three, the Hebrew word olam and the Greek words ion and ionios that are used in conjunction with wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, punishment, fire, Matthew 25, 46, and the so-called unpardonable sin speak of God's dealings with man for the purpose of correction and are to be administered within the ages of time, not lasting through eternity. God's corrective dealings with man are ionios, or of the ages, or belonging to the ages of time, but not lasting through eternity. Point number four. The Hebrew word sheol and the Greek words hades, tartaruo, and gehenna speak of the grave, the place of the dead in general, a reserving until the day of judgment and purification but do not lend themselves to the modern-day Christian view of hell as an unending place of agony and eternal torture. Point number five. The three main Jewish feasts of the Old Testament, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, represent the salvation of all on both the individual and corporate level. These three feasts have three corresponding harvests as noted below, which symbolize the order in which all will be reconciled back to the Father. On the individual level, we are being reconciled back to God, spirit, soul, and body. On the corporate level, God is reconciling the world to himself in three harvests or categories, which are, number one, the overcomers or the barley harvest. Number two, the church in general or the wheat harvest. And number three, the unbelievers or the grape harvest. Point number six. The rich man and Lazarus is a parable that represents the Jews and the Gentiles. It is not meant to be taken in a literal sense and does not support the idea of a never-ending hell. Matthew 13, 34 gives us key information as to the nature of the teaching style of Jesus when he spoke before the multitudes. It tells us that whenever he spoke before the multitudes, he always spoke in parables. Always. In fact, it is actually telling us that he did not say anything to the crowds without using a parable or figurative language. Point number seven. The words hellfire, unquenchable fire, and lake of fire all speak of a fire that purifies. More specifically, the words fire and brimstone literally mean divine purification. The English word fire in these instances comes from the Greek word P-U-R. Our English words pure, purge, and purify all have their roots in this Greek word P-U-R. The English words brimstone and or sulfur define the character of the fire. The Greek word theon translated brimstone is exactly the same word theon, which means divine. Point number eight. The teaching of free will, also known as free moral agency, is a distortion of the true understanding of the will of man versus the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty ultimately triumphs over all things, including the will of man. 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us we are bought with a price, 
and are therefore the property of God. We can rest assured that since God has paid for the human race in full through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ, He will not rest until He gets everything that He paid for. He will not be shortchanged. Point number nine. There's two more to go. Hang on. There are many scriptures which declare the salvation of all and the reconciliation of all things. Here are just a few to consider. I'll just mention a few of these scriptures, but I have longer lists also that uh, I have a list of about a hundred and there's a book called Read and Search God's Plan by Dr. Harold Lovelace that has a list of about 600 scriptures that refer to God saving everyone. But here's a few. Genesis 12, 3, Psalm 22, 27 through 29. Zephaniah 3, 8 through 9, Luke 2, 10, uh, John 12, 31 through 32, uh, Romans chapter 5, the entire chapter speaks of it, Romans eleven thirty six, First 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28, uh, just to mention a few more, Colossians 1, 16 through 20, and Revelation 5, 13. Point number 10. Beginning with the early church, there is a long tradition of Christians who believe that God will ultimately restore all people and even all things through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. Just to name a few, Irenaeus, Theophilus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Eusebius, Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzen, Ambrose, Didymus, Hilary, Titus, Diodorus, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Cyril of Alexandria, Maximus of Turin, Theodoret, Peter, uh, Chrysologus, and then we go on to some more uh, recent and well-known people, Abraham Lincoln, Hannah Whittall Smith, Jose Ballou, Thomas Whitemore, Thomas Allen, Thomas Thayer, Andrew Jukes, J.W. Hansen, A.P. Adams, William Barclay, who was a well-known Greek scholar, believe this, A.E. Nock, Charles Pridgen, uh, Ray Prinzing, J. Preston Eby, Elwin Roach, Robert Beecham, Lewis Abbott, Loyal Hurley, George Halton, Dr. Harold Lovelace, the great Dr. Harold Lovelace, who I knew, who recently passed, uh, Randy Bonacarso, John Gavazzoni, Dr. Stephen Jones, Thomas Talbot, Charles Slagle, Gary Amaralt, uh, who I knew who recently passed as well, Richard Garganta, Dennis Caldwell, Mercy Aiken, Ken Eckerty, Martin Zender, Ray Knight, L. Ray Smith, uh, Robert Rutherford, Jerry Boschman, Rob Bell has alluded to it, uh, some people that I know personally, David Davis, Otis Orser, Craig Lejeune, Lewis Thompson, Billy Thompson, my good friend Chris Danton, and myself personally, Thomas Kissinger. There's been many people down through history who have believed and taught this. So I just want to close this teaching with a quote from George Houghton. It's a very challenging quote. It peels the paint off the wall, but it just gives us some things to think about. The following words by George Houghton are most challenging. The established visible church has preached its multiplied sermons seeking to prove its tradition that the vast majority of God's human creation will be lost finally, irrevocably, and eternally. And not only will they be lost to God forever and ever, but they will be given up to the most sadistic, inhuman, ungodly torments that could be devised by the vilest fiends. According to the tradition of the church, this hellish torment is to fall upon all who do not believe. It matters not a whit whether they had opportunity to believe or not. It matters not at all if they were born in the darkest jungles of Africa, the swamps of Borneo, or the deserts of India or China. The fact that they never heard that there was a God will be no excuse whatever. The fact that they never heard that God had a son will not impede their dreadful destruction. Heathen who never heard that God had a son are, according to this teaching, faced with the same dreadful doom as men who heard the gospel from their birth and yet rejected it. To add to the stupidity of their teaching, they make pitiful attempts to prove that this is the justice of God and that God is manifesting His love in the punishment of sin. The doctrine of eternal punishment is based on a literal interpretation 
of some of the metaphors of Scripture to the complete neglect of many other Scriptures. No doctrine has ever been propounded with more confidence and greater bitterness, nor with a grossness and coarseness more hideous and repugnant, and in the face of the love and kindness of God, more inconceivable and incredible. Well, I've given you quite a few things to think about. So, ladies and gentlemen, you are witnessing and hearing information that is bringing to you a modern-day reformation. It's here, and it's time to hear it and listen and acquire this information. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Examine all things. Test, try, prove, and examine. And I promise you, you will see a God who loves and saves all. A God whose love is unlimited and His power is irresistible. Our God, through Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world.